Amen. Um, as my kids were uh, getting older, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you know, you wrap gifts, and the question is, do we leave the gifts out, um, and will they guess what the gifts are? Yes. And um, it can become complicated, and as they get older, it becomes more and more complicated, and you start to wrap things in a generic way, and then Linda and I just finally gave up, and we wouldn't put the gifts out at all until Christmas morning, because there, you know, kind of a deal. And uh, anyway, so it, it, it just Christmas is always changing. It's always getting more complicated. And, and uh, this year we added a dog to our family, uh, little Millie Trueblood. And um, she's the best ever, first dog I've ever owned in my life. And uh, so it's a whole new experience for me. And so we bought these like, um, these chewable pig ear things. And, um, you know, because we know that she loves them and, and this is going to be her Christmas gift. And without even thinking about about it. We've got this table. We let her into our room and, and these different treats and stuff are down in her stocking. And man, she wanted that stocking <laughs> and, and, and she wanted it bad. And it was a confrontation. It was a, it was not a very Christmassy confrontation uh, that we had, but I, I, I never knew smell is now part of things. So um, Christmas can get complicated, <laughs> but it's fun. Amen. It's fun. And God blesses us with fun and and family, and song, and I know before we really get going this morning that some of us, we come today, and our cups are really full, and praise God for that, amen? amen. Um, and, and, and some of us are here this morning, I've talked to some of you, and your cup doesn't feel so full this Christmas, um, and you've gone through some stuff, and um, I just want to know that we see, want you to know we see you, we see you, we're praying for you, Christmas is for you also. Amen? Amen. I'm going to expect those amens this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, okay, it's my great privilege and honor to read the Christmas account to you today, to honor Jesus with this. Luke chapter 2, verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. So we're going to do today what we do here. Um, we're going to read the scripture to you, and then we're going to pull details out of it that need to matter to us and that we need to learn from. So the very first thing we're going to pull out is that night. That night. Which night? The old holy night. Amen. Amen. It was that night. It was the night that Jesus was born uh, in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph. We don't know if they were in a stable. We just know that there was a manger. There was a feeding trough there. And Jesus, baby Jesus, was laid in that feeding trough because he was born into poverty that night. Oh, holy night. I don't know if it was a silent night. Somebody wrote that into a song. Um, but there may have been some crying. There may have been some, some animals making some sounds. Um, it wasn't a silent night probably, but it was a holy night for sure because the holy one was there, amen? amen. It's a holy night for sure. All is calm. I don't know if all, everything was calm, uh, but everything was definitely bright because the angels are about to come and the glory of the Lord is about to, to shine. And, and, and so everything is definitely bright and... and uh, Anyway, Zechariah said this the very first week we were together. He prophesied this. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light, that's a name for Jesus, from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Jesus was not born to be cute. He was born to be king. Amen. And Jesus came to save us because we were on our own path and he came to bring us a new path. Amen? Amen? It's very, very good news and very, very serious stuff. So when Jesus is born, he's born into poverty. Why is he, why is he put into this feeding trough? He's born into poverty. Uh, his parents didn't have much. And that matters. God, God chose that intentionally to come into our space, uh, into our humanity. And, 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 and God Almighty took on human skin. Like it's crazy and he's surrounded by smelly, noisy animals for heaven's sake. But that's the way he chose to come so that every single one of us, no matter how small, could identify and could see Jesus coming to identify with us. And he walked in our shoes and he experienced our life the way that we experience it, all of it. Can I get an amen? All of it. 
And not only did he experience it, and he grew up that way, and, and this is just the first part of it, but he grew up that way, and he experienced our life, and he didn't run screaming. Because it might be part of you. It's like, well, if God just got close enough to me, would he run screaming like everybody else has? No, man, he, he lived our experience, and he still went through with it. He still considered us worth saving. He still took on a cross after walking in our shoes and getting to know us. I love that. So it was that night, the king of all mankind came that night and in and nearby, it says nearby in the fields nearby. So it's right around Bethlehem there. There are shepherds and they are um, watching their sheep. And it says that an angel appeared and, and right there, verse nine says, suddenly, suddenly. I love that it's suddenly. As if you weren't going to freak them out enough. Suddenly. Um, it's like a jump scare, right? Suddenly. Um, I've got this great uh, alarm clock at home. And uh, when it's real late at night, I can whisper, hey, Alexa, set an alarm. And she'll whisper back, yeah, I set an alarm for you. And it's so great. You know, and then like as it approaches the morning and I'm still asleep, um, uh, the, the alarm clock actually starts to glow very, very subtly, very slowly, brighter and brighter and brighter, right? Because like what's it trying to do? It's trying to be very subtle and like, like get me used to the idea the alarm's about to go off. It's a very kind alarm, <laughs> right? Like, like why weren't the angels this way? Like you guys could have started about a mile off, maybe glowed just a little bit so that we knew that you guys were coming. You could have sang maybe just a little bit so that we knew something was about to go down. Suddenly, they're right there. Freak out. The good news is that they didn't have a heart attack. Amen? Verse 10, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. Thanks a lot. He said, I bring you good news that will be, bring great joy to all people. Say all people. All people, this is for all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord. He has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. So this news is for all people. And he gives us titles for Jesus. And the titles matter. Um, titles, and titles that don't really go with an infant, um, they're, they're meant to shock us and surprise us. The titles, he's going to be a savior. That's significant. He's going to be a savior. He's going to be our savior. It's such a powerful word. Why is it a powerful word? Because savior indicates to us that the reason he's here is because it's a rescue mission. Right? Like that's what's in the word savior. Somebody needs saving. Who needs saving? Us. We all need saving. Why do we need saving? Well, this whole series we've been talking about, God has brought this path of peace to us. And it's this path that we walk with God and he brings peace into our lives. The problem is we like our own path and we choose our own path. The gospel is that all of us have chosen our own path. And when God brought his path, we didn't want it. And when we chose our own path, we broke us, amen? And we broke us so bad, we couldn't unbreak us. Only Jesus could unbreak us. And so a savior came on a rescue mission because we needed one. Verse 13, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So it's a vast host suddenly emerges. This freaks them out all over again. And, and, and it's a vast host, right? It's like not like two or three angels that are in your, your uh, manger scene at home. Um, it's, it's a vast host. It's a, the Greek is a multitude of angels. This is a large army of angels and they burst out praising God. Did they sing or did they just praise God with words? We don't know, but man, they, they went for it. And, and, and I just love the way that that's described because here's what it implies to me. It implies on behalf of the angels, emotion and passion. This is a big deal for them. They burst onto the scene and they start praising God. Why? Because this is a big deal for them. We don't think about what's going on with the angels very often. 
Um, First Peter 1, Peter says, the angels long to look. Did you know that? They long to look into the unfolding um, history of, of God's redemption story with mankind. They're curious. They're captivated by it. As they've watched this whole thing unfold, they are invested. The angels themselves are. And so here they are on this monumental moment of history. And of course they start praising God. They're, they've come to announce his path of peace. Luke 2, 15, when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. Lots, lots of stuff going on here. Uh, first thing I want you to, to notice is they've got two directions to follow in order to find the actual baby Jesus. First, they know he's going to be in Bethlehem. It's still a town. How do we know which one? It's the only baby born tonight that's laying in a manger, laying in a feeding trough for cattle. Not not lots of other babies that night, all in feeding troughs. Amen? Amen. So it's just him. So they know how to, and then then they say, let's go. And it says that they hurried there. Again, there's emotion in them and you need to see the passion that's in them. Like, we're not gonna think about it. We're not gonna make a plan. We're just gonna go right now because the angel just told us, let's go. There's exuberance, my great aunt Joe would say. They were exuberant about it. They were excited. Again, it's emotional. Um, the reason you need to see how excited they were is because we're gonna look at another group of people in just a few minutes, a little preview for you, and they don't react the same way. They're going to react very differently. Verse 17, after seeing him, so the shepherds made it to the stable and the shepherds told, after seeing him, they told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. So they're evangelizing, they're spreading the news that they've heard. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and she thought about them often. The year one of my kids was born, and I won't say, but we got kind of surprised um, when the labor happened. And it happened um, December 31st. And we were literally, Linda and I were in the hospital room um, and we were, we were watching the, the clock tick down to midnight and she was in labor. And the baby was born uh, at 12.43, 43 minutes after midnight. And it was a big deal. And... Uh, you know, it was a big deal already, but I remember the nurses coming in a little while later and saying, hey, there's some news crews <laughs> that would like to come and film and talk to you. And, and uh, we were on the news the next night. And of course, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Did Linda want to torture and kill me? Uh, we still, we don't know. We don't know. She didn't go through with it, which is great. Uh, and yet, um, but hey, mom, we know you just went through this massively exhausting thing. Um, smile. <laughs> Put yourself together. Here we go. Um, so I got to imagine that moment when Joseph sneaks up to Mary and shakes her awake and says, I know you're just trying to get some sleep here with little Jesus in your arms, but there's some people outside. (laughs) Did she want to choke and kill him? Maybe. Maybe she glared at him just a little bit. Um, Did she have time enough to get rest? We don't know. Were her clothes pressed? No. No. No, was there a mirror? Was there opportunity to put herself together? No, no, right? She had to know the moment that she was in. And Pastor Tanner made this great point last week. He's like, if you really allow your imagination to embrace what it is that Mary went through in the first two chapters of Luke, he's like, she should have had a two chapter long panic attack. And I think he's totally right. It's a a very good, anyway, the shepherds were the first group of people to come and witness the birth. And I say witnesses, because I think that's big. We're going to look at this group of witnesses. We're going to look at another group of witnesses in just a second. But think about the the concept of witnesses for a second. Um, 
you know, whenever anybody gets married, there have to be witnesses. And then there's a, there's a form that we fill out that's a legal form at the end. And, and some of the witnesses have to sign the legal form to say, yeah, I was here. I saw the thing go down. And I'm part of the proof that this thing happened legally, right? Like that's all part of it. Like we understand that concept. And so that's part of what the shepherds are doing. Do you see how God is trying to orchestrate this thing? He says, this is massive and I've got to make sure there's witnesses. And these witnesses are going to come and see the thing. And they're going to go and spread the news that they saw it with their own eyes. So you get that first group of witnesses and everybody who talked to them were absolutely amazed. And then you have the second group of witnesses, the Magi, the Magi. So you have to go over to Matthew, a uh, different book, um, the other gospel written by Matthew, Matthew chapter two, verse one it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men from East, Eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, I'm going to pause this real quick right there. The timing of this, this is not that night, by the way. This is not that night. Um, we don't actually know. We, we know it's around that time because that's what it says. It's, it's around that time that Jesus was born. But if you know the story of the Magi, which we call the wise men sometimes, or we three kings, even though they weren't kings, um, they probably saw this, this light, this star, whatever this thing was in the heavens, and then they had to organize a caravan for however far away they were to travel to Jerusalem in order to find this king. And this could have been months. By the time they actually get to Bethlehem and see Jesus, Jesus was probably six months to a year old, we think. Because the Greek word that's used there is child and they're no longer in a stable. They're at a house by that point. Um, so your, your uh, nativity scenes are wrong. Sorry. Sorry. Um, but anyway, so they arrive in Jerusalem. So they had seen this star and there's, there's an old verse in the book of Micah. He's an old Testament prophet. And he had said, um, a star will rise from Jacob and a scepter will rise from Israel. And so there was this old Testament prophecy that says, there's something about a star coming and that's going to mean King in Israel. And so they knew about this. So they saw this, this astronomical thing and they started heading toward Jerusalem because it's the capital city and they don't know any better, right? And they start asking, verse two, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. And, and so they're asking around. So you got to imagine this caravan of magi and they're going around the streets of Jerusalem because they don't know any better. And they're just asking people, have you seen the king? Have you seen the baby born? Have you seen the new Messiah? And like people are getting stirred up a little freaked out maybe. Verse three, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Hold on to that. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. And he asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they looked up, you know, they dug into the old Testament. And they found this prophecy that said Jesus was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And so they tell him that. Now, they probably created a stir asking everybody in the city. Somebody at some point said, we've got to get you to the palace. And then they come to King Herod to tell him that a new king is born. What does that mean? You're not going to be king anymore, Herod. Was that an awkward conversation? Yeah. Scale of one to 10. ten. 10, for sure. Very, very Odd. And, and so he gets the religious leaders together and he's putting a brave face on the whole thing and he gets the scribes together and we're going to have a Bible study together and figure out exactly where the baby's been born. So all these people, all your religious leaders, they all know what's being said. They all know what's going down. And the reaction from the people is pretty significant. Herod is troubled and the people are troubled. Why are they troubled? This is... This is the religious capital of all Israel. The temple is there. These are the religious leaders of the whole country. Why are they troubled? Bethlehem, they were excited. Not these guys. Matthew chapter two. After this interview, the wise men went their way and 
going on to Bethlehem, the, the star that they had seen in the east, it's like it popped up again and guided them to Bethlehem and it was ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was. The Greek is actually, it's like it, it appears over the child's head, which if you looked at old paintings and you've seen like glow coming off of their head, it comes from this verse. I don't think that's really how it went down. I don't think they had halos, but this is what they had in mind is that star was right over Jesus. Like if, if there's any doubt, it's him, him. And when they had seen the star, they were filled with joy. Uh, just a little detail for you. Bethlehem is six miles from Jerusalem. So when they're in Jerusalem and they find out we've got to go to Bethlehem, it's six miles away, just six miles. So Linda and I have step uh, counters. And I went walking yesterday. And by the end of the day, I checked my step counter and I had walked 5.7 miles. Now, I'm no athlete, okay? It was just a normal day doing stuff. 5.7 miles. Six miles for them to travel? You're not talking about a big deal, yes? So they go. The wise men go. Maybe it's a day's journey. Maybe it's a two-day journey. And you might know the, 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 the details Herod had this plot to kill the child. I'm not going to get into any of that. The wise men, they, they fall down on their knees, literally, and they worship the baby, and they bring him the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, kingly gifts. It's an incredible account. There's two big things I want to draw your attention to. First, the reaction that the two witnesses experience, because they're very, very different First off, we've got the Magi, and they are educated. Um, the Magi were this ancient class of, of, of kingly advisors, and they were trained to be kingly advisors. You go back in the Old Testament book of Daniel, and it actually refers to Magi there because it was this classification of people that went a, a certain kind of regimented training and mentoring in order to be wise advisors to the royal class. And so they were trained in astronomy and, and astrology and philosophy and, and religion. They were trained in all of these things. They were highly educated people. The shepherds, not so much. They're just watching sheep. Um, not a whole lot of preparation for shepherds. You even see in the Old Testament, uh, David is King David, he becomes later, but he's, he's watching sheep as a kid. Um, why is he watching sheep as a kid? because it doesn't take a whole lot of IQ and training to watch some sheep, right? Like anybody can do it. Have you got a pulse? You can watch some sheep. Next, uh, the Magi were wealthy. They bring kingly gifts to Jesus. They know how to bring Christmas gifts to the king. The shepherds, not so much. Do you notice that the shepherds show up without a gift in their hand? Right. Uh, Gentile and, and Jewish. Um, the, the Magi were were Gentiles, they were foreigners, they, they would not have grown up in church the way that the shepherds would have. The shepherds were actually Jewish. They had gone to Sunday school and they knew the stories and they knew Yahweh. So two very, very different groups of people. And then trusted and not so trusted, the Magi, uh, the reason, part of the reason that they would have been shuttled off to Herod's palace, think about that for a second. Like, why are they saying this crazy thing on the street and somebody's like, we've got to get you in front of the king of the country. It's because they saw the size of their caravan. They saw the way that these guys dressed. They saw the way that these guys talked. Like these are our trusted, educated individuals. The shepherds, not so much. Um, again, you might've grown up with Old Testament talk about the shepherds and David was a shepherd and Abraham was a shepherd and Jesus had even said, I'm the great shepherd. But... Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that at this time, shepherds could not even give testimony in court. They were not allowed to because they were so disrespected. They were seen as thieves. They were seen as liars. They were not able to keep the Sabbath and, and, and the different laws in the same way that other professions were able to. And so they were highly uh, suspicious and disrespected in that culture. And so God chooses them as witnesses. And then, then hygiene, right? Hygiene, yeah. Like not so much, right? Like two of the gifts of the Magi are perfume for heaven's sake. I'm saying they smelled good, amen? <clears throat> right? But the, 
The shepherds, again, not so much. The magi are sent to tell the city and the shepherds are sent to tell the small town. I just think that's powerful. God creates two different groups of witnesses and he selects them very, very carefully and sends them to two very, very different places. And the, the big lesson that I get from all of that is that the gospel of Jesus Christ was sent to everyone. The angel said, for all. Don't we do this thing? And we've done it as a church for 2,000 years, really. Is we get this beautiful gift from God. And it's not very long before we start thinking about who doesn't get the gift. Who gets shut out? The angel said, this is for everybody. This is meant to come to Everybody. Jesus isn't just for one group of people. No matter how you categorize and no matter who you tend to categorize out, you look at that list and you're like, oh my gosh, everybody's included there. God's making a point. Isn't God always making a point? It's, it's for all of us. Um, the next point that I pull out of that passage, the two towns react very, very different ways. It's almost a tale of two towns, isn't it? Um, Bethlehem, uh, they respond astonished. Um, the Greek there is thamazo. It's to marvel at or to wonder or to admire this news that you just found out. Like they're, they're absolutely excited and they're thrilled in Bethlehem. Not so much in Jerusalem. I mean, they're so excited and they just react with excitement. There's something childlike about that, isn't there? I was at the mall the other day and there was this little girl and she was riding on one of those like plastic horse things. You know, it's like, what a brilliant idea. Who thought of that? I'm gonna take a hard piece of plastic. I'm gonna paint it to look like a horse. People are gonna put quarters in all day and just have the time of their lives. And the thing is, you used to have the time of your life on things like that and so did I. And she still was, and it was amazing to see that. But then we get old and decayed and complicated, don't we? We need a whole lot more in order to bring a smile to our face. What was it about Bethlehem? And they were excited, like little kids, giddy with everything that was going on, praising God. And then Jerusalem, not so much. They're, they're troubled or disturbed. It's terrasso, it's anxious or disquieted or troubled. Later, when Jesus is older, he's going to walk on water, if you remember that scene. And one of those times, the disciples look out, and they think he's a ghost, and it freaks them out. And um, when they're terrified, it says that um, they were terrasso. They were that kind of freaked out. That's the same Greek word. And then when Jesus is in Gethsemane, and he's sweating drops of blood because he's about to go to the cross, and he says, my soul is disturbed within me, terrasso. It's a negative word. I'm having a difficult time with this whole idea and everything that's in front of me. And so the people in Jerusalem find out that the Messiah is born and that the baby is born and that the king is finally here. And they're Tarasso? Why? Think about it. I'm going to make you think about it. You're like, it's Christmas Eve, man. I got things to do. No, no, no. No, I got you. Think about it. Why? They're not excited. Not only are they not excited, not only are they disturbed by this news, but they don't go to Bethlehem. Why don't they go? It's six miles away. Linda and I were t uh, talking about this and it's like, well, there's, there's all these possible reasons. Like maybe they thought Herod would be mad or maybe they didn't have the money or, or maybe the, the journey, they felt like they needed time to prepare for the journey. And, and all of these things could have come up and like, well, if there's a new king here, maybe things are going to get violent. Maybe I should hold on. There might be a thousand different reasons why somebody would not go. But do you know, historically, like we've got documentation that says, uh, rabbis at that time, when they were training up little Jewish students, you know, who were like coming up in the faith, they would say, if you've prayed today, but you didn't pray for the coming of the Messiah in your lifetime, there was no worth to your prayer at all. 
That's how desperate they were for the coming of the king. That's how much they longed for him to come. And you're telling me that the wise men are walking around saying, where's the king? Because we've seen his star. It's ready. He's been born. Like we're going to Bethlehem because that's where he is. And all of Jerusalem. And I'm just, even if you just think it's the religious leaders, just the pastors and priests, they go and they go alone. How's that possible? Like that absolutely rattles me that nobody went six miles that's nothing. You're too busy and don't have money. And what will people think? Absolutely shocking moment. It's a gut punch. John 1.11 says that when the word, the Messiah came, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. It's something about humanity, isn't it? So why? Um, I'll just... I'll just try because he's a new king because he's not a cute and safe little baby, no matter what Ricky Bobby says, right? He didn't come to be cute. He came to be king. And when Jesus came to be king, he came to make demands. When God brought a path of peace, he brought a path that wasn't your path. And he brought a path that wasn't their path. And if a new king was here, things were going to change and there was going to be risks. And I better think about that. And by the way, how attached am I to the path that I'm currently on? How attached am I to my current job, to my current money, to my current king? Let's also be real. For most of us, the real king that we're comparing to is ourselves because we're in control. And so they don't go and it just kind of hit me. I'm like, you know, I think what they did is what most of us do. We don't actually go to Bethlehem and look at the baby and say, I reject you and I don't want your kingship in my life. We just don't go. We just stay where we're at. Um, Linda and I went to Illinois and visited family a week ago and we were on the plane on the way back and the plane was playing a movie, thank God. And, and uh, it was Indiana Jones. God, still doing action movies at 80. What a marvel, right? Crazy. Have you seen the third movie, Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail? Have you seen that one? Um, and, and, and I mean, I won't tell you the whole thing, but they get the grail and, and there's this earthquake as they're trying to get away. The ground splits open, and all of a sudden, uh, this, this woman falls down into the crack, and she's about to lose her life, and her name's Elsa, and she's not Elsa Frozen, she's Elsa Nazi. Um, <laughs> sorry, kids, but um, she was there first. Um, but Elsa is down in there, and, and Indy's trying to save her life, and He's only got one hand and she with the other hand is trying to reach for this grail. And he's like, I can't save you unless you give me both your hands. And of course she doesn't. And she wants her life and she wants the thing that she wants at the same time. And she falls. And then the way the plot goes is Indy falls in there as well. And then all of a sudden here comes Sean Connery, you know, all cool calling him junior the whole movie and he's got to get through to him. So Indiana, you know, he said, Indiana. Um, and he's like, let go. You got to let go of it. And I know you want the thing, but the only way you're going to survive. What an incredible truth about us is we want Jesus, but we want our old way. Don't we? We want the king but we want the old king too. Like we want his rule. We want to sprinkle a bit of Jesus in. The problem is the word and. We always want him and. So it's Christmas Eve and I have absolutely no right to confront you with anything this morning. But I'm going to give you just a tiny thing. And that is you can't have Jesus and anything. It doesn't work that way. You got to let go, Elsa. 
You have to. It's the only way that it works. When he comes, he doesn't come as the safe uh, baby. He comes as the king. So surrender. Would you guys stand? Surrender. Later on, Jesus would say, you can't serve two masters. Because it won't work. And maybe, just maybe, there's just a few people in here. And maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you now. And maybe you've tried to do Christianity and your way, and you've been frustrated. And maybe the truth for you this Christmas is that you've got to let go and you've got to surrender it all. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for taking us back to this, this ancient text. This text, Lord, that we read every single year, Lord, and you just keep surprising us, Lord, and showing us new things. But Lord, I pray for a spirit of surrender in us. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We need your help. Jesus, thank you for coming with that path of peace, God. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.